Hi, and welcome to Mondays with Marlo. I am so excited. We have been trying to get this guest for a year and a half, but you are so busy, <laughs> you are so proper, you're traveling the country back and forth with your wife, I'm happy to. Yes. Uh, no, that's I'm great. Around the world with my wife. Really? So, yes. Well, what's great for us is our, our site, MarloThomas.com, is really for women. We have a lot of guys, too, and you're welcome. But I really want to get women to dream again, yes. you know, and to have confidence and to get rid of fears. That's what we've been talking about for a year and a half, and that's why we've been begging for you to come, because <laughs> you're, the, you're the master of this. I don't know how we've done this without you all this time. Oh, I think you've done quite well without me for many years. <laughs> anyway, we've got questions just pouring in, and we're very excited. We've got a live audience. We've also got uh, questions that we've picked up over the weekend. So I'm going to start right away, if that's that's okay. Great. Right? Okay, this is from Deirdre. She says, you've changed so many people's lives with your books and your seminars. Was there anyone in your life who guided or coached you about life? Is that why you thought you could do it for others? Um, I think I, I, I grew up with a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. And when you experience suffering, you hate to see people suffer. So I looked for answers and I didn't have one individual per se. I did have one person that played a critical role, a teacher. I was, um, I was in a speech class when I was a sophomore in high school. And um, I was a very small guy, believe it or not. I was five foot one. You're kidding. Uh, no. But I had a, a fairly wicked sense of humor. And, uh, and I was very interested in girls that were much older than I was. And so in my speech class, there was the head cheerleader. And I was, I, I had the delusion that I could get her somehow. That I could make her laugh. And I got, I thought for sure I was in trouble because the speech teacher pulled me aside and he says, Robbins, I want to see you after class. So I'm like, oh, I'm completely busted. And he sat down and he goes, you know why I'm sitting down with you? And I said, I think I know why. He said, I've never seen anyone who can talk to their classmates and have them be spellbound before. He said, when you talk, he said, people listen. People that don't even like you listen to you. He wow. said, and I said, I'm looking at him like he's crazy. He said, because you know, you're so passionate. He goes, you don't read a script. You just, you just come from your soul. And I'm, I'm thinking I was going to get reprimanded. And he said, you have a gift. And he said, I have a speech here. I want you to go memorize the speech because he said, Mr. Robbins, I think I know more about you than you think I do. Memorize the speech and I want you to go do a speech competition. And I said, well, you got to be a senior to do that. He goes, yeah, that's the normal rule, but not for you. Wow. So I read this, this script called The Will to Win, which made me cry because it was my life. It was a brutal life this guy went through, but will was put, pulled him through, just pure will. And I got up and gave my first talk and I won first place and I went to you know, the state championships and so forth in persuasive oratory, so to speak. And uh, so that definitely played a role with me. But I think there are moments in your life like that that, that help you understand. But I think the biggest thing was I love people so much and I hated suffering that I read 700 books when I was, starting when I was 17. My goal was a book a day, I didn't do that. But I would get a book on psychology, physiology, philosophy, anything, but then I'd try to apply it to help somebody, help myself first. Because you know, I was, for example, I was majorly overweight and a little guy. So I lost all the weight and all my friends were like, you're getting girls' attention. How do I do that? So I helped them, and they lit up, and I got addicted to that, seeing people light up, seeing them change. Right. And then by the time I was in high school, I was Mr. Solution. You had a problem, I had a solution. Wow. Especially if you were a girl. I was happy <laughs> to it, right? you know? um, but, And then it grew. I developed some tools. I, I learned some tools when I was in, you know, 17, 18, 19, where some things called NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. It was very famous. It was brand new technology in those days, and it showed you how you could change things in minutes that would take years sometimes. It was a conditioning tool. And I challenged psychiatrists and psychologists, and I got on the radio in Vancouver, and I said, give me your worst patient, I'll handle them in a half hour, an hour. You know, and they wow. like, he's a liar, he's a charlatan. But then I did these live events, and I took patients they worked with for seven years, like a woman with a snake phobia, out of control, afraid of thinking of a snake, waking up four oh, wow. or five times a week, you know, seven years of therapy, still doing it. 30 minutes later, I wrapped the snake around her, you know? So wow. those became my, my signatures, right? I began to show people. And then I-, I How came, to get past fear. How to get past their fears and how to get themselves to follow through. And it kind of opened up things. Then I worked with athletes and business people and Princess Diana and President Clinton. It just kind of grew from there. Okay, we got to get more questions in here. You're too good. <laughs> You're too good. Uh, this is from Sam. Do you have any tips? Our audience loves tips. And thank you, Sam, for being with us. How do, how do, any tips on how to overcome your fears and take the first steps to achieving your dreams? I'm, I'm shy, so it's hard for me to make friends and get, no, oh, that's a different person. Do you have any tips on how to overcome your fears and take the first step to achieving your dreams? It, it depends on the individual. Everybody's different. But the fastest way to get over your fears, I give you two different approaches. One is uh, find something you're more scared of than your fear. <laughs> because uh, some people are afraid of public speaking or afraid of doing anything, but they're more afraid of disappointing their children. You know, They're more afraid of missing out on the opportunity. They're more afraid of not living the life they want. When I was a kid, I would do this little thing for myself, uh, and I've done it throughout my life, called the rocking chair test. Someone 
taught it to me, I don't know who it was, years ago I read it in a book or something, and it was the idea that if you're trying to find out whether you're gonna do something or not and you're scared to death, imagine you're 80 years old and you didn't do it. You know, oh, wow. Chair. And how do you feel? And if it doesn't bother you, then don't do it. Right. But if you think like, like skydiving or you know, I, I'm a helicopter pilot, you know, and I, I don't have time, I have energy, but if I thought at 80 years old, I could have been flying and taking people down on the water and doing all this crazy, and I missed out on that. That's a good you thing. Know? So you can either find you know, what it'd be like to miss out on your dream or what's something you're more afraid of than your fear, or we'll all break through our fears when we want something bad enough, right? right? You know, it's like, I don't care what it is. I, I saw a man the other day, I've known him for years, and he lost 80 pounds and he's in his 70s. And I said, what made you finally lose the weight? And he goes, you know, you've taught for years. He said, I really finally wanted it. Okay, so let's I just- really wanted it. Okay, so let's come up with some tips. So one tip is you have to really want it. Well, and one tip is to passionately figure out, right, the why. I believe in that reasons come first, answers come second. Uh -huh. If you get a strong enough why, you can figure out how to do anything. Right. But it's a why that's gonna drive you. So I'd sit down and say, why is this a must for me, not a should? Right. Because lots of people have a list of things they wanna do or like to do. I should lose weight, I should get through my okay, fear. Okay, why? The so, second tip? So you make it a must. Right. Third piece is find your deepest fear and then think of if I don't face this fear, what's it gonna cost me? What's the thing that I'm even more afraid of than the action? And the most important thing is, like we have people who do a firewalk, I show them how to change their state of mind. The way you change your state, meaning the, the state you're in, if you're in a bored, scared state, you're gonna act a certain way. If you're in an aggressive state, you're gonna do something different. And the same person who can be really nice can be mean when they're in a mean state. Right. Mean people can be nice when they're in a nice state. Right. The way to change your state from uncertain and fearful to courageous is not that you don't have fear. Courage doesn't mean you don't have fear. It means you're scared, but you do it anyway. Right, exactly. Right? And so that's a state of just determination or certainty or, or aggressiveness. And the way, the fastest way to do that is to make a radical change in your body. Like I was, you know, uh, 17 years old, trying to figure out how to survive, uh, sleeping in my car. And I did two things. I would feed my mind, so I'd go read biographies. I'd go, I'm old enough and ancient enough to remember there was no internet. And so <laughs> we actually went to the library. And I would read these biographies and I'd read what people are going through in their lives. And people are historic people. And I go, man, my life has no, no problems right, compared to that. Right. So that would inspire me. But then the other thing I would do is I started training my body. I would go force myself to go on a run and I was no runner. I had 38 pounds more weight than I have now. And my you know, my stomach going back and, and forth. Five one or something. <laughs> no, I wasn't five one then. I grown a little bit. Oh. I had a nice little gut on me, a little beer belly. <laughs> but I would, I put on music in those days. I used to have one of those Walkmans. You know, it's like right. the size of a crate compared to an iPod. Right. But I would put that thing in there. I listen to music of heart. You know, and I would go to this song like Barracuda. I would run till I was going to spit up blood because when you put yourself that hard physically, fear is physical. So uh -huh. is courage. Oh, that's interesting. And so if you make a radical change, you go lift weights, you go for a really aggressive walk or a sprint, even right. if you've never done it, it changes your biochemistry and all of a sudden that determination will show up and the fear will disappear because you're in a different state of mind, you'll do something different. Great. I hope that helps you. Uh, <laughs> now this is from Jose. I'm very shy, so it's hard for me to make friends and get noticed at work. How can I change that? Uh, come naked to work. I think that'll <laughs> change it very quickly. <laughs> um, I would say, first of all, all of us have um, uh, kind of an identity for ourselves, a way of defining ourselves. And human beings don't usually stray from that. So if you consider yourself to be a conservative person or a shy person, I know the way you move to some extent. I know the facial expressions, the gestures, the way you use your body. And it's all consistent with the fact that human beings, our strongest drive is the need to stay consistent with how we define ourselves. So what kind of person are you? Uh, optimistic. Yes. What else? Enthusiastic. Yes. Um, happy. Yes. Yeah. And so I bet there are times when you're not feeling so optimistic or happy, right. but you find a way to get back to that. Yes, I do. Because that's who I am. Right, That's your right. self-definition. That's right. If your self-definition is, uh, I'm a situation where I'm kind of, uh, what was the word he used? Uh, uh, shy. Shy. Th then you're going to find a way to get to a place where you kind of cower back. Right. The fastest thing you could do to change your experience would be to create a new little thing, a simple thing like erase. The minute you go, I'm shy, you go erase. That's a BS story. Uh, BS meaning uh, belief system. <laughs> okay. now that, that's just a story. And if you tell yourself a story long enough, you start to believe it. And once you believe it, you act like it. I, I'll give you an example. I don't know if you've ever, when you were a kid, somebody said you could get me the salt. And you don't want to get up because you're eating your meal and you say, Mom, I don't know where the salt is. You know, conveniently, right, exactly. you don't know where it is, right? right. And I go, you know where it is, it's in the kitchen. Go get me the salt. And you go, I don't know where it is, get me the salt. So you finally get up and in your head, you're going, I don't know where the salt is. I don't know where the salt is. And you really look. 
and you open the cupboard, I don't know where the salt is, and you really look, it's not here. And they go, it's on the second shelf. I don't know where the salt is. You keep saying this, just I don't know where the salt is. You really look, it's not here. They walk right in front of your face. They reach right in front of you and go, what is this? Right? You know, everybody's had an experience like right. that. Your eyes saw the salt, but your brain wouldn't let you perceive it because it doesn't want to make you a liar with yourself. Right, so it right, creates right. what in psychology we call a scotoma, a blind spot. When you keep calling yourself shy, you believe it. You go, Tony, I've always been shy. Up until this moment, do something that's completely outside what you would normally do. Something, become somebody else. Decide who's the most playful, passionate, outrageous, fun person you know and behave like them for two or three days. Just push yourself to behave like that. And here's what's happened. It'll be shocking, it'll be weird, it'll be different, you'll feel uncomfortable. But after a while, you'll get reinforced. It's like if you get a nice haircut, you, get, you make a change in the way you look, people will compliment you. You'll get some compliments and those compliments will make you want to use those other parts of yourself. You are shy. There's a part of you that's aggressive. You just haven't found that part. That's Find that great. Part. That's great. This is from Himanero. How do you let go of anger and resentment? I have so much anger toward my ex that I can't shake and I think it's unhealthy for me. This is a it's, big question. It's, it's hugely unhealthy. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. And your instincts are right. And the fact that you're looking for the answer means you'll find it and you'll, you will follow through. The question is, will you do it now or you wait a while and keep suffering? I think it was Nelson Mandela said, uh, resentment is like, you know, drinking poison and expecting your enemy to die. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, it just doesn't work that way. That's great. You know, the, when people say, I, I need to forgive, to forgive, you have to have a belief system that you're better than somebody else, that somebody harmed you. Most people are doing the best they can. Human beings have a need to feel significant, they have a need to feel certain, and out of feeling insignificant, uncertain, they sometimes do stupid things. You know, it takes two to tango. Somebody once said, I think Spinoza said, no matter how thin you slice it, there's always two sides. <laughs> and even in my own experience, when a relationship doesn't work, it isn't that they're horrible. This person may have done something that hurt you, but they didn't do it to hurt you. They did it because they felt insecure. They did it because they were starving for love. They did it because they didn't feel like they were important enough to you. They did it for a variety of reasons. You don't have to know, but you need to move on. And instead of forgiving, forgiving is like you're better than, just think about this, forgive yourself for being so caught up in this because the anger is hurting you, it's not hurting them. That's good, that's very good. This is from Frankie. What's the most common thing that holds people back from pursuing their dreams? Well, the answer is fear. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the biggest thing is um, all human beings have two fears. I don't care if it's President of the United States, you know, top athlete, actor, actress, I don't care what you're dealing with, billionaire. Everybody's afraid at some level that they're not enough in some context. Right. Not smart enough, not pretty enough, not strong enough, not rich enough, not funny enough. And you may not be feeling that right now in your life, but we all feel that, and it brings up our deeper fear that if I'm not enough, I won't be loved. And love is like oxygen for the soul. If somebody doesn't have that sense of aliveness and love inside of them, they feel dead inside. So people come up with all these things so they don't ever find out they're enough. Like, you know, I, I can't do this because I'm too busy. Because they're afraid if I'm not too busy and I do it and fail, I'll look like I'm not enough and I won't be lovable. Right, right. Or I have this disease or problem. People always have labels for themselves. Mm -hmm. And the labels are a way to say, see, it's not me. It's not me. It's this, I have this thing. Right, I have right, ADD right. or I, I, you know, I've been through right. this. I was raped. Being raped is the most horrific thing I can imagine. I want to harm that person if I right. go to hurt you. Right. But you're not hurting today because you're raped. You're hurting today because you're not in a relationship because you're raped. You're not in a relationship today because you're deathly afraid of being in a relationship. Right. Everyone is. Right. 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 Until you get in one. Until you get yes. through that. Right. So fear is what stops people. And the only way you know to deal with fear is move through it. There's no way around it. It's the old thing, if you're going through hell, just keep going. That's <laughs> right. Oh, so somebody said that. Was that it's, Churchill or it was somebody? Churchill said, said it. Yes, the great good. thing, yeah. This is from Tracy. A lot of people hit their 50s and 60s and hit a wall. They get laid off or they've been doing the same thing for 30 years, they're burned out, or they retire and they find they're bored to death. And yet with the longevity revolution, people could have another 25 or 35 That's years true. to go. So what are, again, we love steps and tips. What are the three steps people should take to begin a reinvention process? It's a great question. It's different for everybody because everyone's different. So there isn't just three, but I can give you a direction to look. Um, first of all, you need to get, uh, make a decision. Um, you know, I just talked to a guy the other day that came back from Iraq, two tours, totally fine. And then he jumped with a bunch of his buddies in a river in uh, Florida and, a sh you know, a crocodile came up and took off his arm. All right, makes two trips to Iraq and here's his arm. Oh, no. And, what an awful and, story. But the guy was, like, the guy was the nicest, happiest person you ever meet. And I just, I always find people like that and I go, what are you doing differently up here than everybody else, right? right? And he said, well, Tony, I said, I said weren't, you, weren't you angry? Weren't you sad? He goes, I, I was in the hospital and I felt like my life was over and I was feeling sorry for myself. And he said, and I realized something. My life is over 
unless I decide right now to give up this story, to give up this mindset, and just decide that I'm going to make my life the richest thing it could be. I think whenever you get to a wall, you have to decide, look, I'm, I'm not going to live this way anymore. I don't care what it's going to take to change. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but this is not acceptable. Because we get what we tolerate in life. If you'll tolerate from yourself just you know, being mediocre, then that's how your life's going to be. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is you really need to find a role model or get around somebody that inspires you. Because inspiration changes human beings. You, know, you can be the, the same person, uninspired, can be like, you know, they're, they're not exactly going to move mountains. And you find that person when they find their passion and they look like a genius, right? <laughs> Creativity comes through them, ideas are going because you're in a totally different state of mind. So once you set the, set the standard that says, I'm not going backwards, I'm only going forwards, the way to find your passion is try different things, but also get around passionate people. I always tell people, you become who you spend time yeah, with. Absolutely. You know, if you spend time with people, you know, economically, they've proven over the years, they've done studies where most people's economics are, on average, very similar to the top three to five people they spend time with. That's what their economics show up. What people's relationships are like. You know, if you're, everybody around you has a lousy relationship and they're always talking about, oh man, I gotta go back to the old woman or the ball and chain or the prince of darkness or you know, whatever you think. <laughs> if, if that's what your thought is and your friends are that way, you're gonna start thinking that way about your spouse. It just shows up that way. If you're fortunate enough to seek out some people that really have a great relationship, you're gonna start to have one. So second step is get around where it's better, let something hit you. And, and third would be develop these relationships with people that are going to inspire you and just to play with them you have to raise your game it's kind of right. like i always tell people if you're going to play tennis and you're a great tennis player and you play against somebody who's much less skilled than you are it's only a matter of time for your game's going down if you're not a good tennis player at all and you get on the tennis court with somebody really good just to stay on the court your game has to grow so i say get around people that are playing the game at a higher level than you and just being around them will raise your game and then once you find out what you want and you know why you want it trust me most of us in our lives have had something, maybe you, at one time in your life, before 50, before the horrible 50 or 60 <laughs> age, of which I'm 52 and I have a feeling you might be almost 50. No, nowhere near it. <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> so, you know, it's not so horrible. What it is, is you need to create something that's compelling, something that you're going to go for, something that you're excited about. The fastest way to do that is don't accept anything less, get around those people and get yourself in gear. You've had things in your life before 50 where you had a dream, you had a goal, something excited you. You didn't even know how to get it, but you became obsessed by it. It was a must for you. And then all of a sudden you heard conversations, you met people, things came together and you figured out how to do it. It's the same after 50 as before 50 in that area. You just got to stop the story that says I'm 50 and it's over. That, that's so, I've got so many questions here. I'm trying to figure out, you know, which is the one that's going to help more people. Um, and there's one that I just saw that I, I, I have to find it again. But, but really what they want to know is, what is your day like? Oh, here it is, so I guess. <laughs> Tony, you, you rock. You don't want to know. This is, this is live. He's right in there. I want to know more about your rituals. Do you meditate daily? Is there a systematic way of doing it day in and day out? I love your stuff, but I, I sometimes get bogged down with so much information. I need a better way to organize it and apply it. So that's yeah. a very interesting thing. Yes. I mean, you, you are such positive energy that I feel like I'm going to be able to go on this gas for like the, <laughs> next, the next year in my engine here. But, uh, but it's a great, you know, how do people start? The day, I, you know? I, I think it, it, if you wait to start the day, you're in trouble. I, I start looking at what do I want to accomplish in this decade. <laughs> uh, I'm serious. Right. I, when I was 17, I said, here's what I want to do with my life. In my 20s, I want to be able to help anybody change their life if they're committed. They really want to, I want to know I have the ability to help them and do it. In my 30s, I said, when I was still 17, I said, I'll do that with groups of people. In my 40s, I'll do it with huge groups. In my 50s, I'll do it with organizations. In my 60s, I'll do it with governments. And in my 70s, my whole life is a spiritual path, but I'll talk about it in a more religious terms. You know, right now, I don't tell people what to believe religiously. I just say, whatever you believe, you got to practice it. And I've been ahead of it each stage by about a decade. So I already know what my life is about. Then I look at my year or my month and I say, What's, what are the most important outcomes I want to achieve with my family, with myself, with my foundation? I have goals and dreams and things I'm after because life's not about getting your goals anyway. When you get your goal, it feels good for a while and then what? Right. right? You've got to have the next thing. The next it's thing. really the purpose of a goal is it makes you grow. It makes you, I tell people, what you get will never make you happy. Right. But who you become either make you very happy or very sad. Right. And so you need something that's going to make you grow. And then as far as rituals, I believe in what I call uh, the hour of power or 15 minutes to fulfillment or 30 minutes to thrive. You, you pick the one you want. And for 15 minutes minimum, 30 minutes or an hour if you're willing to do it, I start my day and I do something physical immediately. So I have exercise I do, you go for a run or a walk or whatever. But while I'm doing it, 
I am conditioning my mind. I'm seeing what I want to create in this day. I'm seeing what's going to happen in advance. It's like we all know our brain's capacity to create, but only if you engage it. So I, I do this hour of power and I actually, uh, if you go to my website at TonyRobbins.com, there's a front page piece there on my ultimate edge I used to do on television. And there's a 30 day program that shows you what to do every day. And you listen to it while you're driving in your car, while you're working out. Oh, I want to get and that. I'll, I'll, that I'll send you one. It's called Ultimate Edge. And if you Great. go to my site, Ultimate Edge, and you can get it, and we'll, all you gotta do is pay the shipping, I'll send it to you for free, you and try it for 30 days, and if you wanna keep it, keep it, that's if you don't, you can great. send it back. But it'll, got, it'll show you what to do a step at a time, it'll, that'll be great. it'll we, guide you. Th th that's great, we have three minutes, I'm getting the, the hook here. Okay, you got this, it. This is live from a guest. Tony, what are your thoughts on helping women overcome shame? Wow, it's, uh, that's a big question. Um, women are so, women are harder on themselves in this area than men are by far. I think it has to do with cultural conditioning Absolutely. more than anything else. Being the good girl. That's exactly right. And yet, for you to feel alive, that passionate part of you has right. to feel alive. Right. So it's this fight. I think the, the best way to deal with shame for people is to find what you're most proud of. You can't, you're never gonna deal with shame. You have to overwhelm it with the good. It's kind of like if every day of your life you look around and you let it happen, news comes in, and it's almost always these days something to scare you. If it bleeds, right. it leads, they say in the newspaper business, right? <laughs> right? So something to jar you. If you're going to have your life, you have to what I call stack the good. You have to flood yourself with the good. You have to say, what am I proud of in my life? What am I grateful for? And you've got to literally think of three or four or five things, people, experiences. It could be something little you're proud of when you're a kid, something today. But if you do what I call an emotional flood, you flood yourself with all the beautiful, proud things, things you're grateful for in your life, you'll find that'll overwhelm that feeling of shame and the shame feeling will disappear. But it won't disappear by analyzing it. Right, right, right. Then you just get more in your, more no, in your I head. I like this idea of yeah, flooding you it flood in. You flood it. And when right. you flood it, and you do this, I can see you do this. You're a person, you look for the good, you find the good, and you stack it. Yeah. And that's what gives you so much energy. Right. I do the same thing. Listen, if you want to right now, you could want to cut your, your own throat just by looking at all the misery in the world. Right. But in the same moment that misery is happening, somebody's having children, somebody's making love, somebody's creating a breakthrough. It all depends on what you focus on. Okay, I know, I know, I know we have to go. But this is from India. We've Great. got a, a guest from India. Tony, what do you suggest for couples who are having interpersonal sexual incompatibilities? How do you yes. get through it? Well, uh, first of all, you have to identify, when you say incompatibilities, is that hunger, desire, frequency, is it style? It's not one thing. And if it's hunger and if it's desire, that can be reignited if you can get through some of the shame elements, which may be there for one of them. Right. Or if you can find what really triggers someone. In other words, everybody's had trigger fantasies, things that like got them riled up at some stage of their life. I don't care who they are. If you can open up and find out the core of what that fantasy is, and you can start to relive the emotion of that fantasy with your partner, it's an interesting thing. If you're in a peak state and you're excited about something and you see your partner and you're in a peak state and you see your partner, peak state, see your partner, pretty soon you see your partner, you go to peak state. <laughs> but if you come home from work and it's been a rough time at work and you're really, really tough and you come and you're in a bad state and your partner's trying to cheer you up, but they're not successful because you're in such a bad state and they're bad state, see your face, bad state, see your face, bad state, see your face. Pretty soon when they see their face, they're going to go on with the wrong partner. Right. Sexuality is like anything else. It's driven by human emotion. So I'd identify, is it frequency? Is it style? Is it shame? Is it feeling like you're not paying enough attention? It, it, don't make it that we're just incompatible. Because when you make up that story, incompatible means it won't work. Right, you need right. a story that says we love and worship each other. We're going to find a way to light each other up sensually, sexually, as much as we can in any other area. That's great. That's You are so good. <laughs> no wonder you're, you're traveling so all the time. <laughs> well, this is an exciting question. This is live from Stacey. She says, Tony, today is a big day. I'm so thrilled and excited for Breakthrough to air tonight on OWN. It's at 10 o'clock tonight, 10 right? 10 o'clock tonight, yes. So tell us a little bit about it. Well, I wanted to create six specials where people are facing so much stress today at such extreme stress, I thought, if I could show people that they have no problems by contrast to someone else with much bigger problems, and I could show them how life could change in 30 days, it would inspire people, it would remind them what they're capable of, because we forget. And uh, we get used to our lives being a certain way. So I found, for example, um, a couple that were getting married, they flew down to Mexico, saved their money, rented this big hotel, and after being married, there's a tradition of this hotel that you jump fully clothed into the ocean, or into the swimming pool, rather. So the wife jumps in, they take pictures and laugh. The husband jumps in and there's nothing but blood. And when they pull him out, he becomes a quadriplegic. Oh my God. And so everybody said, you can't make that, that's depressing. I said, no, what will be exciting is to show that even that man can still have an extraordinary life. Extraordinary life, I know it, but I gotta figure out how to do it. I can't just tell him, oh, your life's gonna be great. I meet him in his house. 
He's in this little house in L.A. He can't move. He stares at the TV, and they give him drugs all day. He can't leave the house. His wife is afraid to leave the house because if he falls over, he'll stop breathing. Oh, my Lord. So she now can't have children, can't have intimacy. Oh. She's his nurse now. Horrible situation. So I said, you know what? I've got to change the meaning of all this. You can't change the events of life, but you can change what they mean to you. Right. And I met people that are quadriplegics that are the most passionate people you know. They make other people look like they're standing still. Right. So I said, here's what we're going to do. You can't get out of the house? Fine. You're going to Fiji. So I have a resort at home there, but I figured the journey to Fiji alone, getting there for the guy who couldn't get out of the house was like mind-boggling. Oh, of course. But then two days after that, I take him skydiving. Oh, and no. That was the guy who thought he couldn't go across the room. And then for 10 days, I separate him from his wife, who's his support system, to show him he's strong, and show her that he's strong. And I have him go out and do murder ball. Murder ball is um, basically rugby for quadriplegics in these metal chairs that look like Mad Max movies. You know, they come smashing each oh, other. Wow. And this guy who thought he was so fragile, smashing into people oh, and scoring wow. goals. And then before he was actually, you know, had a problem, when he was, quote, able-bodied, his biggest dream was to build a truck from scratch and be a desert racer. And so I said, what was your dream? Once we got him healed up, what, what was your dream before? When, you know, when everything was supposedly perfect, and he told me. And I said, well, where's that, that truck? He said, well, I never built it. I couldn't get around to it. I couldn't get myself motivated enough. And he goes, I, it was in pieces. And when I knew I was a quadriplegic, I gave it away. So who'd you give it to? He told me. I said, no, actually, he doesn't have it. I said, I bought all those pieces back, and they're in your garage. Oh, and I said, you, you got, were something You got else. four days. Oh, you wow. got seven of your best friends. And I hired a firm that did these CAD drawings that redesigned the wheels so he could drive the oh, thing right. with his elbows. Right. right. And I said, if you can build it in four days, I'm going to be waiting in the desert, and you and I are going to drive 110 miles an hour. And I'm not driving. I'm going to sit on this seat. You're driving. Right? Wow. And we did it. So I won't tell you the end of the story. The end of the story is even better. But that's just tonight's story. So, so, so it's so like you brick, see this couple of turnarounds. So, so what, you're gonna, what you're showing to all of us is that you can break through. That's anything. That's the breakthrough. Yes. Anything. No matter how tough right. life is, there's some, a breakthrough is a moment in time right. when the impossible becomes possible for right. you. Right. And, and that is not just a mental thing. You actually do something about right. it. And for some people, they can meet somebody and be inspired. For some people, they get so angry, finally they break through. You know, for some people, they learn a tool or a strategy and breaks it through. Everybody has different ways, but I want to show people each week how to do that. The next week's is going to be a man whose wife was murdered in a drive-by shooting. She mm. saved her son from being shot, so her seven-year-old son witnessed it. Mm. She dies. It's the love of his life. The man is crushed. He has two boys. He gets injured also, loses his job, loses his house, oh moves into the Salvation Army with his two boys, won't get up in the morning, gains 150 pounds, and just says, my life's over. I turn him around, and I'll tell you the whole story. It's next week's piece. Well, we'll, we'll, don't tell us I won't tell, tell, tell you, but I, but I will tell you that he, he's not only changed his whole life, but he's now a chef, and he lost 160 pounds. Oh, my gosh. You know, I wanted to ask you, you were a little guy. Were you bullied when you were younger? Yes. And, and what, what did you learn? What can you tell us about that? Because we get so many questions about how can you stop bullying? Is it talking you to your parents? Is it, what you do you, you what can we bullying. do about bullying? You need to, what we need to do is, it's like when people say, I wish it was better. Don't wish it was better. Make yourself stronger. You want life to change? You gotta change. You want life to be better? You gotta get better. With your kids, you gotta teach them to be strong. Mm -hmm. That's the only way, because if you take away the bully, there's just gonna be a new bully that shows up in right, their life. And right. maybe not a physical bully, maybe it's a verbal bully. People have to learn how to be able to stand up for themselves and protect themselves. Right. In our society, we care so much that sometimes our caretaking makes people weak. Right. So my view is you've gotta make your kids stronger. You gotta show them that this is an opportunity to become stronger. And to I speak up stronger, not, not speak beat up. up no, but, not beat up, but speak up, not to put up with this right, stuff. Right, right. To, to put that line in the sand that says this is how it's going to be. Right. And, and I also think they have to be able to protect themselves. It's interesting. If a child can protect themselves, they don't usually get in a fight. Right. They tend to get in a fight when they can't protect right, themselves. Right, exactly. Because the fear, someone else smells the fear right. and they pick on That's you. That's right. You it's know? like dogs and I horses. My, my son came to live with me. I, I, three of my children are adopted. One of them came when he was five. He was so scared he couldn't go to the end of the driveway. And he got bullied. And the first thing I did, he wanted me his mom wanted me to go talk to the school, and I said, don't do that. You'll humiliate him forever. He'll always be weak. I said, I'm going to show him how to stop this kid. And so I went in and taught him. I have black belt in martial arts, and I taught him how to take and break through bricks and break through wood in a few sessions. And, his com and I said, now, you'll never need to use this. When he comes at you and starts to dish, you just remember what this feels like and look in his eyes. It's animals smell fear, and so do bullies. <laughs> That's right. And when you have zero fear... They don't mess with you. That's great. And it that's changed, great. changed the way he walked. It yeah. changed his life. He's, today he's 32 years old and he's got my two grandchildren oh, and he's a, happily married and he, he's never been bullied. Right? How great. Yeah. 
Okay, can I just do one more, just about finance? I've got so many finance sure, questions. Quick. Okay, people get very scared, you know, when their finances aren't going well, yes. and they've lost money, and they don't, they haven't got a new job, and it, is there any mystery with money that you can sort of unleash for us? I mean, what is it about money that so crushes people? And, and well, I think it's the same thing about sex. We have mixed emotions about it. Uh -huh. Like we. Love to see people succeed at first, and we want to tear them down and think they're only doing it for the money. We make up stories because what we're really underneath it all is we feel like if we don't have enough, there's something wrong with us. I think what we have to do is understand money comes from only one thing long term, and that's finding a way to add more value. Even the bumblebee going for that flower, it might be selfish, but its legs, pollen sticks to its legs, that's how we get more flower, right? Does that right. make more flowers? The world is designed that even selfish people have to add value for them to prosper in some way. Now, right. some add more value than others, right? right. So I think you gotta find a way to add value. I think the other piece for people to understand when it comes to the financial world is to say that it isn't that complex, but you have to understand if you make up like a doctor, if you make the doctor God, you're gonna have lots of problems. Right. Because he should be a coach to you. Right. And there's multiple doctors. I was diagnosed with a tumor and they told me, the first doctor told me I'd have to do surgery. And when I did my own study, I found out, you know, you can die from that, it's brain surgery. Then another doctor wanted me to fly to Switzerland and take injections. If I would have listened to him, it turned out four years later, those same injections were found by the FDA here. They were outlawed because they created cancer, right? People can be sincere and be sincerely right. wrong. When right. it comes to money, no one's going to be able to manage it better than you, meaning you can get coaching for other people, but you have to decide what you're going to do in that area. So you've got to find a way to add value. And specifically, you've got to decide this is an area I'm going to start studying and mastering. And it, it isn't that complex. Here's the simplest thing on money. There's a, go get a book called The Richest Man in Babylon. It's the one I gave all my kids when they were grow, growing up teaches you the most basic thing. The same thing that a guy like Sir John Templeton, who was the first billionaire investor did. You pay yourself first. Most people spend everything. You take a minimum of 10% and you set that aside and that does not get touched and it gets invested. You wanna get money to go to work. Right now you're a money machine, you make money. You want money to work for you so you can do whatever you want and the money does it for you. So you can learn how to make those types of investments. You take 10% of that money and you, you use that immediately to reduce your debts. And you take 10% of your money and you give it away even when you don't have any. I did this when I had no money. I can remember I, had, I was down to like $21, $22, $21 and some change. And I was broke and I couldn't pay my rent. And I was 19. And I went to, to the El Torito and, and this place called Marina Del Rey. I drove there so I'd feel a little richer in this nice ocean area, right? And I went to El Torito because it was an all-you-could-eat taco and salad bar. <laughs> And I don't know what it cost, $9, $6, whatever it was. And I loaded up for the winter. You know, it's like a chipmunk in the evening. And at the end, I'll never forget, this little boy walked in with his mother. And the little boy was like in this little suit. And he was so gracious to his mom. He pulled out her chair. It was, so, it was just, it was inspiring to see how much he loved his mom and, and the grace of which he did and the respect he had. So I'm left with whatever I had left, $17, 18 $19, you know. And I looked at this boy and I was inspired. And so I went up to him and I introduced myself. I said, I'm, I'm Tony, I can't remember his name. I'm Joe, whatever. And I said, Joe, I said, you are a classy man. I said, the way you treat your woman, I said, that's respectful, that's cool. I, I'm really impressed. He goes, she's my mom. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that impresses me even more. I said, well, it's pretty amazing you take her out to lunch. He goes, well, actually, I don't have a job yet. He's like, you know, I don't know, nine, 10 years old. He said, I don't have a job yet, but I will in the future. I said, yeah, you are taking her to lunch. And I took all the money he had, boom, and I just put it right there in front of him. And he looked at me and his eyes got big like this. And, and I wasn't doing it to get her attention. She wasn't, it wasn't like that at all. I just, it was the right thing to do. And he looks at me, because I can't accept this. I said, yes, you can. He said, how come? I said, because I'm bigger than you are. <laughs> and I got up and I walked out of that building. Now I had no car because I had no money for gas. I walked home, but I didn't walk, I like flew home because it was in that moment, it was like I was declaring, I tell people all the time, you'll never get beyond scarcity. You have to start beyond it. And the way you start beyond it is you give when you think you have nothing to give. And it's amazing what it does to your own psychology. It's like, I tell people all the time, if you don't give a dime out of a dollar, you're not gonna give 100,000 out of a million or <laughs> a million out of 10 million, right? right? So I feed now two million people a year through my foundation. Here in New York, I'm doing this seminar for 5,000 people. I donated 30 meals for every person that came, right? So I have 175,000 meals. I love that, it's part of what drives me, part of what inspires me. I don't just do well myself, I don't just help other people do well. People that. I can't reach are also going to do well. They're at least going to have the basics of what they need. But I do that today with large sums of money because I did it when I had no money. Right. It's right? amazing and, that and, you and did that. that. But that's what'll but that's what'll make people change. If if you'll just say right now, you see somebody who's worse off than you are and go help them, suddenly you'll realize you don't have any problems. And right. so 
And that's part of what Breakthrough's about. I hope right. people watch tonight, you know, on 10 p.m. on Own's channel. Oprah's given us a chance to put this message out. I think people will be inspired. And if they're not sure where Own is, they can go to the TonyRobbins.com, and there's a little channel finder, so it'll show oh, you. Oh, that's which, brilliant. So that way you can figure well, out where we'll it is. Well, we'll be watching. Great. Thank you, Tony. So well, we, wonderful being with we you. We went way over, but I, it was worth it. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. <laughs>